be seated. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, worship team. Aren't you thankful for our worship team? I am. I'm thankful for, thankful for Skip back there on the soundboard and people on the tech, back, tech deck. Thank you for serving us tonight. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. I want to talk to you tonight about good news, bad news, good news. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. I want to let our young adults know that we have a young adults fellowship tomorrow evening, Sunday night uh, at 7 o'clock. Hope that you'll come and join us and just enjoy a good time of fellowship. Romans chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. Good news, bad news, good news. Paul says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. We'll stop reading there. We're going to look at the rest of the words of these chapters in the coming couple of weeks. But let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us this evening. Would you take your hand, if you're willing, just symbolically, would you take your hand, just put it on your mind right now, just put it on your head. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your presence here. And I thank you for your powerful word. Father, I pray that you would come by the Holy Spirit and enable us to receive the truth of God. Father, I pray that every hindering thing, Lord, that would prevent us from understanding, from receiving, Lord, I pray that it would be bound in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts, open the ears of our spirit. Lord, open our spiritual eyes. Lord, that we can perceive the eternal truth of God. Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. If your heart agrees... Would you say amen and amen? A pastor stood in front of his sheep one day and he said, I have bad news and I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is that we need a new roof for the church. Immediately, everyone began to sink down in their seats because they knew that an offering was coming. But to their surprise, the pastor continued. But, he said, the good news is that we already have all the money that we need to replace the roof. Everyone started to perk up and smile. That was very good news indeed. But the pastor went on. But the bad news is the money is still in your pockets. (laughs) Beloved, I have good news and bad news and good news about phase two. But what I really want to talk about tonight is the gospel. The gospel is good news and bad news and good news. The gospel is good news. In fact, that's what the word gospel means. It means good news. But in order to understand why the news is good, it's necessary to understand the bad news. It's necessary to understand how bad is the bad news in order to understand how good is the good news. Last week we talked about the good news from verses 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 1. I am continuously not ashamed of the gospel. 
For it is continuously the power of God that continuously brings salvation to everyone who continues to believe. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is continuously revealed. A righteousness that is continuously by faith from beginning to the end. As it is written, he that is continuously righteous by his faith will continuously live. The good news is that the righteous God has acted righteously in human history in order to give the gift of his righteousness to you and to me. And he keeps giving that gift day by day by day as we trust in him. Today, we need to talk about some bad news that helps us to understand why the good news is so good. We desperately need this gift of righteousness from God because the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. And were it not for Jesus, every one of us would be deserving of that wrath. Beloved, I want to say to you, listen, these verses in Romans 1, they are critically important for the day in which we live. Our president once referred to these verses as obscure, but there's nothing obscure about them. In these verses, we find answers to some of the most pressing questions that we face as believers right now. I also want to say that these verses are the Holy Spirit's message to his church. The Holy Spirit wanted the believers in Rome to know the truths that are in these verses. And the Holy Spirit wants us to know them too. So my prayer for you tonight is that God would give you grace to embrace the bad news that makes the good news so good. What is the bad news? That makes the good news so good. Looking at Paul's words, I find three bits of bad news that I want to share with you quickly this evening. Three bits of bad news that make the good news so good. The first bit of bad news is God's wrath. The first thing that we need to understand about God's wrath is that it is nothing at all like our human anger. You know, because of our human fallenness, it's impossible for us to have a clear picture of either God's love or God's wrath without Jesus. Many people today believe in a caricature of God that is based more on human sentimentality than on what God has revealed about himself. When it comes to the love of God, Many people like to imagine God as being a benign being. One who is all-embracing, all-affirming, all-permissive. People like to imagine that God would never put boundaries on us. Nor express displeasure over something that we've done. People like to imagine God like, you know, a grandfather who bends the rules and who spoils the grandchildren rather than the father the Bible says that he is who disciplines those who he loves. People talk about God's unconditional love, but what they mean by that doesn't line up with what the Bible says about God's love. It's true that God does extend his love to every person unconditionally, But God has set conditions whereby people must receive his love on his terms. Does God love every person just the way they are? Yes, he does. But God also loves them way too much to let them stay the way that they are. I want you to listen to me tonight because this little little nugget right here, this will help you. To say that God is love only tells half the story of God. Because God isn't only love, God is holy love. Beloved, look at me, listen to me. This is this is the whole, our whole salvation. This is the whole reason why God had to send his son to die on the cross. God is equally holy as he is loving. God is not more loving than holy. God is not more holy than loving. God is holy love. 
And as we navigate these spiritually perilous times of ours, this is something that can help us keep our bearings. Listen, whenever you hear someone say to you, God is love, I want you to say to yourself, no, God isn't only love, God is holy love. All right, I want to try that. I want to practice that because this will help you out a little bit. Listen, when you're out on the street, when you're in your workplace, when you're dialoguing with people about what's happening in society, this is the piece of truth that you need to know. God is not only love. God is holy love. All right, I'm going to try it. I want to test you a little bit. God is love. Aha, you got it. God is love. God is love. God is holy love. The Bible says that our starting place for understanding God's love has to be the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross, the holiness and the love of God met together. On the cross, listen, God's holy resolve to punish sin met with his loving resolve to bear the punishment himself. On the cross, mercy and truth met together. Justice and peace kissed each other. The cross shows us that God's love is not merely some syrupy, sweet sentiment, but God's love is something far deeper. God's love is proactive love. His love is self-sacrificing love. His love is intervening, rescuing love. His love is righteous love. It is just love. It is holy love. And that also helps us to think properly about the wrath of God. Some people like to imagine that God has no wrath at all. A loving God couldn't have wrath. Others imagine God's wrath to be like our own anger. But actually, God does indeed have wrath, but his wrath is nothing at all like our human anger. When it comes to us fallen human beings, our anger is usually provoked when someone has offended us. When someone has injured our dignity, our anger is an uncontrolled emotion. It flares up. The Greek word for human anger is the word thumos. We get our word thermometer from it. When someone crosses us, the mercury rises and we get red hot. Our anger is vindictive in nature. It's focused on settling the score. But God's wrath is something different altogether from human anger. In fact, it's a completely different Greek word. God's wrath is not personal like human anger. It's not temperamental. It's not vindictive. God's wrath is his just response to sin. It's his punishment of sin according to his holy system of justice. A good way to picture God's wrath is if you think about the demeanor of a judge on the bench. Here in the United States, we have a code of laws and we have prescribed penalties. When someone breaks the law and is apprehended, he is tried before a judge. And listen to me, listen, listen. The judge dispassionately administers justice. It's not personal for the judge. In fact, if it is personal, the judge has to recuse himself. The judge is not enraged on the bench. The judge is not trying to settle a personal score. The judge has a code of laws, and he has a system of penalties, and he calmly administers justice as the law demands. So, listen, when we talk about the wrath of God, we're not talking about the anger of God. We're not saying that God is having a bad day in heaven, and all of a sudden he says, look what they've done now. I can't stand it anymore, and starts heaving brimstones down on us. God's wrath is his steady, systematic administration of justice. God did heave brimstones down on Sodom and Gomorrah, but not before his system of justice had finished its due course. God's wrath is not like our anger. 
And a second thing we need to understand about God's wrath is that it is directed against the twin sins of mankind. Paul says here in verse 18 that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. That word ungodliness, it means irreverence. It is a sin that is directed against God. The word unrighteousness means injustice. It is a sin that is directed against our fellow man. These are the twin sins of mankind. Irreverence towards God and injustice toward our fellow man. The two of them go hand in hand. If you don't fear God, you will take advantage of your fellow man. If you are taking advantage of your fellow man, then you don't fear God. The Ten Commandments address the twin sins of mankind. The first five commandments deal with our reverence towards God. The last five commandments deal with our just treatment of our fellow man. Jesus addressed the twin sins of mankind. When they asked him, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is attached to it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. In the remaining verses of Romans 1, Paul shows how our irreverence towards God leads to injustice towards our fellow man, especially the sin of sexual abuse. We're going to get into the issue of homosexuality in a little bit, but let me point out to you that Paul holds it up in these verses in Romans 1 as the worst way that someone can abuse their fellow man or their fellow woman. Beloved, what our society is celebrating this weekend as progress, God calls the worst societal digression possible and the end of the road. The dysfunction that our society has relabeled love, God calls in these verses the ultimate expression of defrauding one another. God's wrath is not like our anger. God's wrath is directed towards the twin sins of mankind. And a third thing that we need to understand about God's wrath is that it is both present and future. Paul says there is coming at the end of this age a day of wrath. That's the day of God's final judgment. Each one of us must stand before God and give an account of himself, of the things that we've done in our body, whether good or bad. In the meantime, God's wrath is administered in the present by allowing us to speed down the path of ignorance when we choose to ignore him. Well, I bet everybody look at me. The way that God's wrath is administered in the present is that when we turn our backs on him, God does nothing. Rather than stirring our conscience and trying to persuade us to turn around, rather than dispatching messengers to plead with us, rather than sending angels or talking donkeys to stand in our way, the way that God's wrath is administered is he simply allows us to carry on. Carry on, my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Um, no, there won't. <laughs> in fact, listen to this. God not only allows us to coast down the slippery slope, God actually gives us a push downhill. Three times in these verses in Romans 1, it says God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. That means that God accelerated their rate of decline. In their hearts, in their minds, in their bodies, gave, God gave them over to spiritual darkness and ignorance and impurity. They became enslaved by their own sins. God's wrath is administered by allowing us to suffer the consequences of our own willful sinfulness. You know, that's why David prayed in Psalm 19, keep your servant from doing willful sin so that sin might not have dominion over me. 
Beloved, can I tell you with a broken heart, truly broken heart, that that is precisely what is happening in America right now. Did, did you ever stop to ask yourself, how did we get here so fast? You know, eight years ago, when our president was running for office, he said that he believed that marriage was between a man and a woman. Last year, he lit up the White House like a rainbow to celebrate a, a ruling that was an aberration of justice. And on Friday, he sent out a letter demanding that every public school in the nation allow boys to shower with our daughters if they feel like it. How did we get here so fast? It's the wrath of God allowing an acceleration into gross sin of a society that has turned their backs on him. Some people are saying this will bring the judgment of God. That's quite wrong. This is the judgment of God. But you know, because of the subtle nature of the present judgment and because of the delayed nature of the future judgment, people don't believe that God's wrath will catch up with them. If you want to know where we go from here without a revival, look at the list of 21 vices at the end of Romans chapter 1. They describe a society that's completely devoid of any civility or moral decency or love or human dignity. And when a nation's cup of wrath is finally full, God uses another human government to administer his punishment to that people. Paul addresses that in Romans 12. But I want to say, look at me, even so, in the midst of all of it, there's still a note of God's mercy. Because when we hit the bottom of the pig pen, we might lift up our eyes like the prodigal son and say, Father, please forgive me. Do you see how bad the bad news is? N nobody likes bad news. But we need to know the bad news so that we can receive the good news. Three bits of bad news that make the good news so good. God's wrath and a second bit of bad news is natural revelation. What about the people who have never heard the gospel? What will God do with them? If God is just as we say he is, how can he judge people who have never heard of Christ? Paul says in these verses that they are without excuse because of natural revelation. What is natural revelation? Natural revelation is the truth that God has revealed himself to every person in his creation. Paul says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. The creation points us to God. It's evidence that there is a God. And it points to some conclusions about him. Our friend Brian Simmons says it this way in the Passion Translation of Romans 1. He said that God has left his fingerprint on our hearts. And when we look at the creation, it speaks to that place in our hearts. The very existence of creation points us to God. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas argued that everything that has a beginning must have a source. You know, one of the things that modern science has confirmed definitively is that our universe had a beginning. So what was the source of the beginning, if not God? The scale of creation points us to God. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Johann Kepler, I didn't know it, but today is National Astronomy Day. They got, they, got, they got a day for everything. They got Donut Day, they got Hot Dog Day. Today is National Astronomy Day. And Johann Kepler, the father of modern astronomy, said, the undevout astronomer is mad. The intricacy and the beauty and the variety of creation 
point us to God. Paul said his invisible qualities are seen clearly by what has been made. That, that Greek word there for what has been made means a work of art. We get our word poem from it. It can mean the work of a painter or a sculptor. If you see a beautiful painting, you know someone painted it. If you see a beautiful sculpture, you know that someone sculpted it. The glory of a sunset points us to God. The majesty of mountains point us to God. The roar of the ocean points us to God. The splendor of a rainbow points us to God. Isn't it amazing that people will still pull their cars over and hop out and snap photos on their iPhones when there's a rainbow in the sky? The order and the sustainability of creation point us to God. In Athens, Paul preached he has not left himself without a testimony, but he's shown his kindness to the human race by his gifts of rain and crops and abundant food and overflowing joy. The distinctiveness of mankind in creation points us to God. David said, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him, human beings that you care for them, yet you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor and made them rulers over all the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. Why is mankind the way we are Unless we were created in the image of God. You know, scientists flutter when an ape learns a few words of sign language. They go into a frenzy when an elephant holds a paintbrush in its trunk and swats it on a canvas. Progress. But show me who in the entire animal kingdom has done what man has done. What baboon has learned how to mine metals from the earth and fashion them into items that are useful and beautiful. What chimpanzee has learned to dig clay and spin it into pottery and glaze it and fire it? What marsupial has conceived of musical instruments and fabricated them and then mastered them and then written scores of music to play on them all together and in harmony? Show me the pachyderm that has built a submarine or an automobile or an airplane or a rocket. Show me the cephalopod that has made a souffle. Bring to me the smartest canine you've ever seen and ask him to draft a document like the Magna Carta or the U.S. Constitution. Bring me the smartest feline you've ever seen and ask her to perform an open heart surgery. After millions of years of supposed evolution, why is man way up here and everyone else way down there? Unless we're made in the image of God. What does natural revelation reveal to us about God? Paul says that creation points to his invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature. If God is the creator of everything, then he must pre-exist everything. He must be eternal. If God created all of this from nothing, then he must be vastly powerful and infinitely intelligent. If God created all this, he must be sovereign. This is all his. He's the boss. You know, the creation not only points to the majesty of God, but it points to our own finiteness. What is man that you are mindful of him? It brings us to the conclusion that he must be God and we are not. If God created all this to accommodate us and sustain us, he must be awfully good. If God created all this, then he must have a purpose in it all. Now, if natural revelation reveals to us all these wonderful things about God, why would I say that it's bad news? Well, listen, the bad news is that natural revelation is not enough to bring us to the place of saving faith in Jesus But it is enough to make us culpable. In order to come to saving faith in Christ, we must have special revelation. Special revelation is God's saving acts in history, especially as it relates to the Jewish people. Special special revelation is the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit. Special revelation is the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
Special revelation is the gospel broadcast in the world by the church. Special revelation is supernatural signs and wonders done on the earth in Jesus' name. Natural revelation is enough to put the ball in our court, as it were. It gives us just enough knowledge of God to make us responsible to pursue him and liable if we do not. In Athens, Paul said God did all of this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him, for he's not far from any one of us. And that brings us to the final bit of bad news. Three bits of bad news that make the good news so good. God's wrath, natural revelation, and finally, willful suppression. Worship team, you can come help me. Willful suppression. Paul says that we are all deserving of God's wrath because we suppress God's truth in our heart. On my nightstand, I have a little gizmo, and it's compatible with the pacemaker that's in my heart. When I lay down to sleep at night, my pacemaker sends information to that gizmo, and that gizmo transmits it to my cardiologist. And you know, that's just like us. God has programmed our hearts to receive data about him from his creation. He's programmed us to realize that he is, that he is eternal, that he is vastly powerful, that he's infinitely intelligent, that he's sovereign, that he's awfully good, that he is God and I am not. Because God has programmed our hearts for his creation to speak to us that way, our ignorance is a willful ignorance. Our ignorance is due to our stubbornness. We actually have to work hard at staying ignorant. If we haven't seen the light, it's because we've been dodging it. We've been hiding from it. Jesus said so himself. He said the light has come. It has shone in the darkness. But men don't come into the light. They don't love the light because their sins. In chapter 3, Paul quotes David, no one seeks God. All have turned away. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Paul says here, although they had this witness of God in their hearts, they refused to glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful. The truth is, we don't want to find out if there is an eternal, all-powerful, sovereign God because we don't want to bend our knee to him. We don't want to worship, and we certainly don't want to obey Him. We ignore the witness of creation in our heart day after day after day because we want to be the captain of our own ship. We want to be the masters of our own destiny. We drown out the witness in our heart by pursuing everything that life has to offer with gusto. Paul says in chapter 2, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of wrath when God will administer his justice. Beloved, mankind's ignorance is a culpable ignorance. And that is the worst news of all. But after all that bad news, are you ready for some good news? Because the gospel is good news. Here is the good news. Jesus. At the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to rescue us. In Romans 5, Paul said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Paul wrote to the Ephesians, 
like everyone else, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. But because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Christ. It is by grace that we have been saved. What is the bad news? The bad news is that God has made himself known to every one of us in the deepest whispers of our heart. But we have suppressed his whispered and we have stubbornly ignored him. Therefore, we're suffering the harsh consequences of our willful ignorance. And we are piling up offenses against the day of judgment. But the good news is that God has sent his son to satisfy his wrath on the cross. And we can escape God's wrath, God's judgment, if we only stop ignoring his whispers and believe on Jesus. Beloved, nobody likes to hear bad news, but this is the bad news that we must embrace in order to receive the good news of Jesus that is so good. Would you stand on your feet this evening and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place? Oh, come on, let's give him a good praise. 